If you remember chucking stormtroopers into the abyss, crushing ATSTs like cans, and pulling Star Destroyers out of the sky, then you grew up playing Star Wars The Force Unleashed. But which one? Because there were five completely unique versions released across 10 consoles, and in this video, we're going to compare each of them. But before we dive into it, a little bit of backstory. The year was 2004, and LucasArts set out to create a AAA Star Wars game for the next generation of consoles. After brainstorming over a hundred different concepts, they decided to settle on a game set between Episode 3 and 4, with a major emphasis on kicking someone's ass with the Force. What is the core gameplay? <laughs> But the pop culture landscape was changing. By the mid 2000s, superhero movies were taking over and shonen anime was huge. Suddenly, Vader throwing some boxes at Luke just wasn't gonna cut it compared to this. Also, the 2000s saw video games go through their edgy adolescent phase. LucasArts took all of that on board and the result was The Force Unleashed, an over-the-top Jedi power trip that feels like playing every 15-year-old boy's Star Wars fantasy. Everything about this game is turned up to 11. This is Star Wars on steroids in the best possible way. Let's start with the PlayStation 3, 360 and PC version. This was the flagship, developed in-house by LucasArts. So you start the game playing as Darth Vader, who's on the hunt for the remaining Jedi. He arrives on Kashyyyk, where the Dark Lord proceeds to destroy anyone and everything that stands in his way. I've got to say, this is probably the best tutorial level I've ever played. This game wants you to drag a flailing stormtrooper through the air before chucking him into the abyss. It wants you to force push a group of Wookiees off a bridge. Vader then finds the rogue Jedi and defeats him using an ancient Sith technique, the Kamehameha. But he discovers the Jedi has a son. Vader kills all witnesses and takes the boy as a secret apprentice. The game picks up about a decade later. The boy, Starkiller, now carries on the task of hunting down the remaining Jedi. This is where a bit of that teenage edge starts to show. We've got Starkiller's ship, the Rogue Shadow, his droid, Proxy, who's programmed to kill him, and his pilot, Juno Eclipse, who's, well, let's just say she fills out her officer's uniform a lot better than old Jared here. Starkiller tracks Jedi General Kota, a Jedi on the run, to a TIE fighter factory. This level is really good at introducing the players to the sandbox of destruction element. You don't need a card key to open doors in this game, just smash them apart. So Starkiller makes it through the TIE factory and finds Master Kota. An over the top battle follows which results in Starkiller blinding the old master before throwing him down onto the planet's surface. Yep, he's definitely dead now. Vader then sends Starkiller to the junk planet of Raxus Prime to take down another Jedi Master. That's right, this is the same Raxus Prime from the Clone Wars game. Only that one didn't have these annoying little Jawas trying to bash your head in with these welding torches. To be honest, this is probably the most annoying level in the game. You keep fighting these bionicle looking creatures, and they always seem to push you off the edge. And did anyone else just keep missing these ledges and falling into the abyss? Okay, easy, easy. Hop. I'm gonna make it. Ah! So you finally reach this Jedi Master who's gone crazy and built the entire Jedi Temple out of trash. This game somehow manages to make that squat little thing from the pod race that blows up look like a badass. I'll defend you from this Sith trash. Oh no, I knocked over Knock Off Yoda. It's okay, I'll pay for it. This game loves a good quick time event, but a lot of the times pressing the wrong button just gets you stuck in this infinite loop. Geez, how many times can Starkiller take this metal slab to the face? With that done, we continue our hunt for the Jedi. Next stop, Felucia, where you find Jedi Master Shakti. Fun fact, this is actually the third time Shakti dies. She also has an apprentice. This is what I've been waiting for. Let me fight! Yeah, you can add another one to the edge counter. So you take on Shakti and her pet Sarlacc. Oh jeez, what's she been feeding this thing? It's huge! And this is exactly what I mean when I say this game just makes everything bigger. The Force powers the Sarlacc, even the Rancor are bigger than usual. And just look at the size of this door. The same goes for the enemies. That Rodian? Give him some steroids. We can't just have a regular Stormtrooper, they have to have flamethrowers and shields. And someone stick a Gatling gun on that ATST. 
Metal Gear. So when he's not hunting down Jedi, Starkiller focuses on his other passion, fashion. Honestly, this guy is worse than Padme. He changes costumes in every level. Poor Obi-Wan had to go like, what, 15 years before he finally changed outfits? But back to the story. Everything is going swimmingly until the Emperor finds out about Starkiller and forces Vader to kill him. This must be where they got the floating Leia scene from. And just like Leia, Starkiller survives. Turns out Vader only pretended to kill him, and he now wants Starkiller to go and start a rebellion that will help them overthrow the Emperor. Oh, and the ship he's on is heading for the sun, so good luck with that. Starkiller quickly saves Juno, and then they escape on the Rogue Shadow. He then goes looking for Master Kota, who is still alive. You know, after falling for miles. Hey, if it didn't kill Darth Maul, it's fair game. There is a bit of an inconsistency here. Starkiller actually tells Juno to head for Nar Shadda. Head to Nar Shadda. That's right. The very same one from Jedi Outcast. But they actually find General Kota on Cloud City. More on this when we get to the Wii version. This is definitely one of the best Star Wars escort missions. Kota actually helps, unlike the Queen in Phantom Menace. When you are ready to continue, Jedi. He's actually more like a drunk uncle at a bar. No, Uncle Kota, it's okay, come back, come back. Oh, and you also get smacked around by this Ugnot with a bottle. Okay, so they pick up Kota and then head for Kashyyyk, which has now actually been converted into a prison colony by the Imperials. My favourite part about this level is the trophy room. Look, you've got all these different monsters from the movie and then Jar Jar and Carbonite. Shoot. Whoops, I guess I've got to pay for that one too. After liberating Kashyyyk, Starkiller heads back to Felucia. Remember that overgrown Sarlacc? Yeah, you're gonna have to get inside that thing. Giggity giggity. Okay, so you make your way deeper and deeper into the pit. Oh, get off me, get off me. And then deep inside, you find Bail Organa. Shakti's edgy apprentice is here and you'll never guess what, she's turned to the dark side. And she's got a pet Rancor who's also been edgified. Starkiller defeats both of them, but lets the alter alternative teenager go. Right, now that he stopped I... Bail Organa from being digested, Starkiller heads back to Rexus Prime. Oh, hello, gents. Do you mind showing me to where the big thing that... Whoa, 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 where are you going? See, kids never get a bad reputation. It follows you all over the galaxy. So this is the part where Proxy turns up and decides he wants a fight to the death. Oh, and he's also going to cosplay as Darth Maul while doing it. This may sound a bit morbid, but I wish there was a realistic lightsaber option in this game, you know, like in Jedi Outcast. The lightsabers in The Force Unleashed kind of feel like glowing baseball bats. And for those arguing that a realistic lightsaber option would be too violent, let me get this right. So you're saying it's okay for me to do this, but not this. I never actually understood what the hell the Empire was doing on this planet. Are they like mining for giant golden nuggets, which they then shoot up into space? As I said, everything in this game is huge. And speaking of which, it's time for everyone's favorite section. Okay, so the actual visual of Starkiller pulling a Star Destroyer out of the sky is pretty awesome. But replaying this section, I actually realized that the gameplay is a little fiddly. Okay, easy, easy, left, left, no, 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 oh, fuck off, TIE Fighters. All right, with that done, the good guys assemble for the first secret meeting of the Rebel Alliance. Oh, and the Empire's found them already. Turns out that Vader has actually been using Starkiller this entire time. So he kidnaps the Alliance and leaves old Galen to make snow angels. It's a good thing Juno's here with the rogue shadow. Starkiller then decides to do the right thing and rescue the Alliance, who are being held in the Emperor's chambers, on the Death Star, which is still under construction. What could go wrong? When you think about it, it makes perfect sense that the Death Star, a moon-sized space station, would be the final level in this super-sized game. So remember how the movie characters had to sneak around corridors and hide inside the trash compartment? Actor. Yeah, Starkiller's gonna take a different approach. Look at him just wiping out entire garrisons of stormtroopers, crushing walkers like cans, taking on the Red Guards, and then just walking up to the Empress front door, which, surprise, is also huge. All right, time for the big confrontation with Vader. But before that, I'd like to talk about another Jedi game for a second. I remember a lot of people were a bit confused when Jedi Fallen Order was first announced. Right, so this is another game where you 
play as a Jedi taking on the Empire in the dark times between episode 3 and 4. Didn't they already do this with The Force Unleashed? Look, I really like Fallen Order and Force Unleashed. I could make an entire video comparing both of these games, but I think both the protagonist's fights against Vader really shows the difference between these two games. Submit. So having taken Vader to school, Starkiller takes on the big dog himself. I've got to say, compared to what we've just seen, the fight against the Emperor is a little underwhelming. He pretty much just throws these big cans at you. Oh, and if you mess up these quick time events, Galen will just keep taking lightning to the face forever. Also, fun fact, Sam Witwer is doing the voices of both Starkiller and the Emperor in this game. Force Unleashed is famous for having both a light side and dark side ending. The former has Starkiller sacrifice himself in order to let the Alliance escape. In turn, he ends up planting the seeds of rebellion, and I guess they use his family crest as the logo or something. But it's the dark side ending that everybody remembers. You know, the one where Starkiller kills Vader, but then the Emperor ends up landing the rogue shadow on him. Starkiller is then rebuilt to take Vader's place by the Emperor's side. There are several DLCs that carry on this alternate storyline, but you know what? They're so over the top and brilliant that I think they deserve their own video, so keep an eye out for that one soon. And there we have it, the flagship version of The Force Unleashed. It's a game that's over the top in the best kind of way, but it wasn't just big action. The game is filled with cool little easter eggs and bonus content that show the developers really cared about the source material. Yes, some may see the whole destruction sandbox feature as a gimmick, but I think it's fun. And that's what this game is, fun. Apart from the Rexus Prime level, that can go f itself. Alright, moving on, next up we have the Wii version. Nintendo's console was underpowered compared to the competition, so LucasArts decided to outsource this version to Chrome Studio, who kind of just made a completely different game. Yes, it follows the same story and uses the same script and also focuses on Jedi action, but everything else is different. And not just because it's running on older hardware, no, these were creative choices. For example, let's compare the opening level of both versions. The cinematics are different, one set at night instead of day, one has Vader greeted by the 501st while the other has an Imperial officer. LucasArts and Crone must have been developing both games in parallel, so both teams are working from the same script and concept, but the execution was largely up to them. So this being a Wii game, it obviously relies quite heavily on motion controls. Look at this, the immersion. I'm in it, I'm in the f***ing game. There was also a near identical PlayStation 2 version. Porting Wii games to the PS2 and vice versa was very common at the time, as both consoles had similar spec. In fact, the Wii was probably responsible for extending the PlayStation 2's life cycle for another five years. The motion controls seem to be the main difference between the PlayStation 2 and Wii versions. So if you're into that, the Wii version is the one for you. If you'd like to avoid arthritis in old age, then probably go for the PlayStation 2. But joking aside, as far as motion control games, this is one of the better examples. Granted, it's not really a high bar with Wii games. Also, if you played this game on the Wii, you'll remember the Wiimote endlessly purring in your hand. <sighs> The quick time events are still here, but now they're all about wiggling at just the right time. And unfortunately, due to their limited hardware, the characters' face expressions look a little empty. The voice cast is the same between the two games, but a lot of the time they seem to use slightly different vocal takes. You're hunting Jedi. I bring Darth Vader's enemies to justice. You're hunting Jedi? I bring Darth Vader's enemies to justice. Another difference is that this version has Starkiller holding his lightsaber pointing forwards in an orthodox style. This is done to match the direction of the Wiimote. Starkiller also feels a bit lighter to control. There's no Havoc engine or any of the fancy bells and whistles you'd find in the flagship version, but you can still destroy stuff and chuck things and people about. Now, this version seems to have a lot of elements that never made it into the flagship. For example, you can navigate around Starkiller's ship in between missions. 
And speaking of missions, this version includes the Jedi Temple missions, which had to be downloaded as DLC in the flagship games. Galen returns to the Jedi Temple several times throughout the game, each time confronting a false vision of an ancient Sith, which Vader uses as a trial to see if he's strong enough to take on the actual Jedi they're hunting. All of this culminates in a battle with a false vision of his father who pulls him to the light side. Also, the uh, Jedi statues here are like giant Kinder Surprise eggs. Look, there's a purple kyber crystal inside Qui-Gon. This game does have a few drawbacks though. You don't play through the escape mission in the medical facility, it's just a cutscene this time. And same goes for the section where you pull the Star Destroyer out of the sky, which is a shame. So remember how I said the Nar Shaddaa level was cut from the flagship version? Well, it's intact here and this is actually where you find Kota instead of Cloud City. And just like Kyle in Jedi Outcast, the very first thing Galen does is get into a bar fight. And yes, this place is also filled with rope Odians and grenades, although these are nowhere near as annoying as the ones in Jedi Outcast. It also looks quite different from the Outcast version, because you know, you can actually see what the hell is going on around you this time. You make your way through the scum and villainy and find Kota, unfortunately he doesn't follow you around in this version. Look, this level is nothing special, it's just a nice nod to Jedi Outcast. You'll be glad to know that Starkiller's many outfits make a return. It's beautiful. Ah, thanks. I was going for an Asajj Ventress kind of look. There is is also a Bespin level, although this one takes place towards the end of the story. Ah, Cloud City, what a... Oh shit, sorry, sorry, I'll, I'll pay for it. I'll pay for the uh, life insurance. Look, none of these other people care that I'm levitating one of them. Typical city commuters don't give a shit about anything. So Starkiller ends up getting himself involved with a local crime syndicate. And oh boy, do things spiral out of control quickly. You've got bounty hunters, you've got Mandalorians, you've got these cantina creatures. Everyone's after you. Even this evil pirate Gungan. Weren't prepared for that, were you? Okay, so what about the ending? Well, the Vader fight is a bit more subdued here. You don't get to slam him face first into a shield generator. But the Emperor does fight with a lightsaber in this version. You can take him on that way, sure. But I always had better luck just chucking these old PC workstations at him. These CRT monitors can do some serious damage. And that's pretty much it for the campaign, but this game does have a bunch of bonus features and a really fun duel mode with loads of characters. Anakin, you little shite, I had such high hopes for you. And so that's it for the Wii and PlayStation 2 version. Yes, it's a downgrade graphically, but it actually ends up with more content than the flagship, and hence why a lot of fans actually prefer this version. And earlier this year, the game was actually ported to the Switch. And the best thing about this version is it actually lets you choose between the PlayStation 2 style controls or the Wii style motion controls. So if you've never played this version, I'd recommend checking it out. Okay, time to move on to the handhelds. First up, we have the PlayStation Portable version, and this one is a bit of a hidden gem. This is a complete port of the PlayStation 2 version. Yes, the graphics are slightly scaled down, but to be honest, you won't really notice it playing on a PSP screen. What you will notice is a ton of extras on top of what's already there. You've got Order 66 battles. Just pick a character and have them take on waves of clones. My favourite is Qui-Gon just embracing the dark side and electrocuting the fuck out of everyone. You also have historic missions where you get to play through some of the big battles from the movies. We've got Anakin fighting Dooku, Luke fighting on the sail barge, Mace Windu at the Geonosis Arena, Obi-Wan versus Anakin on Mustafar. Anakin, my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy! Although this one ends a bit different than I remember. And then finally, Vader versus Luke on Cloud City. Again, I don't remember Vader being quite as rough on Luke in the movie. I am your father. No. No. These are great fun, and the developers went out of their way to actually match the movie cutscenes inside the game engine. You know, this is the only example I can think of where the PSP version actually ends up having more content than its console counterpart. Pound for pound, this may just be the best version of the game. Alright, next up, the Nintendo DS version. This game takes the levels from the flagship and adapts them to the platform, and it does it pretty well. The game wasn't simplified like many handheld ports of the 
the time, it follows pretty much all the levels and the story from the flagship. The abilities are there too, you've got force push, choke, saber throw, and it does it all in 3D. It's jaggedy as f but it's still 3D. This would have been a good game if it wasn't for one major issue, the controls. All of the combat and force controls are relegated to the touch screen and there's no way to change that. Look, I understand the developers probably wanted to utilize the console's full functionality, but this is not how you go about it. At least give us an option to choose from. Instead, the face buttons just mirror the D-pad. And these touch controls are pretty bad. They're not really responsive and you have to keep looking down at the screen to make Make sure you're pressing the right button. And speaking of touch controls, the quick time events have been replaced with touchscreen mini games, like having to throw these balls into bigger balls. And this lightsaber clash. They're all right, but I remember always wanting to look up at the stuff happening on the top screen instead of the mini games, which would result in me dying a lot. What can I say? It's a real shame when a single gameplay mechanic ends up breaking the rest of the game. Okay, and finally we have the mobile version, which was released on phones running the Engage 2 Symbian platform. This is a condensed version of the game, but it does still hit the major beats of the story. It's not a port of the DS or anything, this was built from the ground up for the phone. Here Starkiller makes his way through these static levels that are made of pre-rendered backgrounds, kind of like the old Final Fantasy and Resident Evil games on PS1. Each enemy has a pattern next to them which you have to quickly draw with the keypad in order to execute a successful attack. And this version was also ported to the iPhone where the the keypad combos were replaced with just having to draw the pattern on the screen. And so there we have it, every version of Star Wars The Force, hold on, what? There's another one? That's right, smartphones weren't the only mobile devices to be graced with a Force Unleashed port. Even your bog standard phone got a version, as long as it ran Java. It's similar in gameplay to the last one, only here Starkiller just stands in the center of the screen and takes out waves of enemies based on the patterns above their heads, which again you have to match with the keypad. And then you get to the boss battles and um, I've got no idea what's going on. Okay, finally that's the last one. At least I I think that's the last one. There are so many different ports of this game that I won't be surprised if there's a version running on a digital pregnancy test. And I haven't even covered the books or the comics or the Legos. Overall, The Force Unleashed was a really cool experiment, and I think it went beyond just a quick tie-in cash grab. You can tell by playing the games that the people making them really cared about the property and wanted to make something exciting and fun. And look, I think it worked. It's definitely the most fun I've ever had with a phone keypad. Thanks for watching. Please let me know your thoughts on The Force Unleashed in the comments. How many of these versions did you play and which is your favorite? As always, remember to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.